if cap and trade could be done, and if it could be done in the way that NRDC wants it done, which is quickly, with 100% auction of, of permits, without corruption, without the financial scams that we've seen in our um, financial sector, you know, that's of course metastasized uh, over the past six months, it would not be a bad way to go. It is so complex with uh, banking of permits, um, with uh, monitoring systems, with crafting of offsets, uh, that any cap and trade legislation that would be passed uh, in this Congress, whether in uh, 09 or in 2010, is it's not going to be written uh, to, be, to be able to be implemented. The implementation is going to be uh, subcontracted, if you will, to EPA or to some commission that's going to have to write the regs. Consider that the REGI system, that's the Northeast system for regulating um, uh, or uh, imposing a cap on CO2, only from power plants, a big sector, but only one of the sectors, took five years to put in place from 2003 to 2008. That's the cap and trade system for 10 states that are kind of a little bit almost homogeneous for one, uh, one sector. Whereas in contrast, British Columbia uh, took five months from conception to implementation to get its carbon tax up and running. The, the BC provincial government announced it in February 08, and it went into effect in <coughs> July 1, 2008. So you're talking about even more than an order of magnitude, you know, a 12-fold difference. And even though things are being learned from the EU or from Reggie, a national uh, system of, uh, uh, of, of carbon cap and trade is going to be monstrously complex and is going to take years and years to get started. I have tried to wrap my head around, and, and, and I've asked people, and I've never been able to, to, to grasp how a U.S. cap and trade system would be transferable anywhere else. Maybe mechanisms, you know, yes, and frameworks, but the amount, the critical issue of how fast that cap is going to come down. Let's say we do a 2% a year so that, you know, we go down 80% after 40 years. Why would any other country feel obliged to go down at the same rate. So it's not fungible, a cap and trade magnitude, whereas a carbon tax is perfectly fungible. If we impose, you know, a, pick a number, you know, a $30 per ton uh, carbon tax, well, that is transferable in, you know, yen and marks and pounds, et cetera, to anywhere else in the world. Now, that doesn't oblige them uh, to go at our rate, but if they don't, then we can use the border tax adjustment mechanism, which is considered legal under WTO rules, where we can impose tariffs that will equalize so that there will not be an unfair advantage to uh, the country that is exporting to us. The problem with trading, well, it's really twofold. One is that some amount of the dollars, dollars that are precious, that either have to go into uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy investment, or have to be distributed or dividended to families so that they're not pushed to the wall by the higher carbon price under a cap or uh, a tax for that matter. Well, under a cap and trade system, some of those dollars are going to flow to market participants, to lawyers, to consultants, to financiers, to specialists, to the regulatory and bureaucratic mechanism that's going to have to regulate and, and monitor all this. Whereas under a carbon tax, we have an existing tax system we're only talking under either system about a couple of thousand points where the coal uh, is sold from the mine to the utility or where the oil is imported or taken out of the ground and sent to the refinery. But all those places are already monitored and taxed and regulated under the IRS code. And there does not have to be a large new bureaucracy that's going to siphon off some of that money. The problem of a carbon tax has always been uh, the, the three-letter word. The carbon taxes or prices under a cap and trade system are going to be really high. There is no way of getting around it. They need to be high to elicit the changes at every level that need to be made to get us off of fossil fuels. It's not just a question of having the 100 MPG cars. It's having everybody or the average drive half as much uh, as, the, as we do now and then 20 years later having that again. So those prices have to be high which means that those monies are going to be, need to be rebated or distributed, dividended back to the American people. It's not just the bottom 20% who will be pushed to the wall. It's probably the bottom 80%. But we need to, to keep faith or, or be faithful and be honest and be candid with the American people about what we are doing. 
yes, this is a tax. It is a tax that is going to sustain our environment, that is going to uh, sustain life for our children and our grandchildren and s species and all beings on this planet uh, that we can do with a minimum of economic dislocation. And here's how. Um, and uh, it is something that we all need to be brought into together.